Good morning, good afternoon, all. Uh, we're going to get started in about a uh, little under a minute. We'll just let uh, any last minute uh, folks join in, get comfortable. So grab yourself a glass of water, a coffee, something, and we'll be back with you uh, in just about 30 seconds. All right, Ken, are we all set? Yeah. Sounds good. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Doran. I'm a technical sales specialist for ITM Instruments. Thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar today via our ITM University. Today's topic is temperature calibrations, drive improvement with practical solutions. Uh, during the presentation, we're going to ask you to kindly mute your microphone. Our presentation should be about 40 to 45 minutes, and we'll have some time allotted at the end to take some question and answers. Throughout the presentation, we're going to encourage you to use the chat feature to submit any and all questions that you have. Uh, please try and take advantage of having uh, Ken connected with us today. Get all the questions that you can uh, in the chat feature throughout the presentation. Uh, so, ITM Instruments has been working closely with Fluke for many years. We pride ourselves on being a leading distributor of Fluke. This is a result of our dedication to offering you our product expertise, service, and competitive pricing. Uh, getting started today, uh, the, pres the presentation webinar is presented by Ken Reeves from Fluke. Ken is Fluke's territory sales rep based in Alberta. Uh, he has over 31 years of technical test equipment sales, which includes over 20 years working directly with Fluke. Ken, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, today's presentation, uh, as I mentioned, is going to be on, uh, let's just get the slide moving forward here, uh, temperature calibrations. So temperature calibrations, we would like to, uh, the goal of today is to to give you a bit more knowledge and uh, maybe improve your overall understanding of how temperature calibrations are done. And at the end of the day, um, hopefully we'll have some tips and tricks in your back pocket and uh, some best practices you can use to um, improve your temperature calibrations, make them more accurate, quicker, faster, okay? Um, that's just an overview of some of the topics we're gonna cover. Uh, we'll come back to this slide on a regular basis. But initially, what I would like to do is just give you a quick overview and review of what temperature calibrations actually are, or what calibration is in general. So calibration is where you take a unknown and compare it to a known standard. Uh, typically, your known standard is more accurate. Um, they consider that the standard. And uh, that is the one where the comparisons are being made. So a, a, an easy, quick example is a tape measure. Uh, your tape measure out in your you know toolbox at home is going to measure you know 12 inches but is that exactly 12 inches and maybe you might use a micrometer to make that measurement where the micrometer is more accurate okay um, there is another concept that i want to make sure that we understand here today because we'll make reference to it occasionally um, it is the concept of traceability now, traceability is really in simplistic terms uh, a, a documentation chain from your actual process instrumentation that you have in the field, the test equipment and test calibration equipment you use to do that calibration, all the way up through the different layers back to ITM standards at their repair and uh, calibration facilities where they send their standards to. It's that complete traceability chain of accuracy. Um, it's important to have that traceability in place if you are needing to prove that your calibrations in the field are accurate. Um, but it in itself doesn't actually guarantee accuracy. And we'll have more discussion on that as we go through. The other concept I want to get across, uh, specifically with regards to temperature, is something called an SI unit. Now, you might have noticed it on the previous slide. SI is the top of the pyramid, and uh, SI is actually French, but it stands for uh, International Systems of, Me of Measurement. Um, so what we use for temperature is the Kelvin standard. Um, if you're not aware of Kelvin, it is basically the same as, um, say uses the same scale as centigrade, 
Um, but uh, zero Kelvin is where, you know, potentially molecular motion actually comes to a stop. It's the coldest that we can go, and it's roughly minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. So conversely, um, zero degrees Celsius is actually 273.15 degrees Kelvin. Um, it's important to know this, uh, just so we have a frame of reference as to what we are when we're talking about temperature in Celsius and Kelvin. Um, we also may, maybe not so much here in Canada, but we may also make reference to our temperature calibrations done in Fahrenheit. Uh, Fahrenheit is a different scale. It doesn't necessarily reference the Kelvin scale, um, but there is a direct mathematical correlation. They're both linear. Um, there's a fun fact I'll let you read down there um, if you're one of those technical people. <laughs> um, but the idea, the concept is, is that as temperature increases, the, the molecules will move quicker. And uh, that's an indication of how much energy there is in the system. And, and temperature is really an energy measurement, okay? So uh, why is temperature and temperature calibration in general important? Uh, first of all, temperature is everywhere. Um, as it says there, we experience and use temperature um, every day. We, we listen to the radio, we listen to grab our phones, see what the weather's like, and we want to get an idea of what the temperature is so we know what layers of clothing to wear when we head outside. Um, similarly, in a process manufacturing um, environment, we want to make sure that we know what the temperature is because we may have specific reactions or spe specific um, events that will happen based on certain temperatures. And so we need to be able to calibrate these devices to make sure that they're providing the correct measurements uh, back to our systems or local indication or whatever the case may be. And it requires periodic inspections, verification, and we have to do adjustments to these. And again, this is where we get back to traceability. The adjustments we're gonna make are with equipment that is accurate enough and traceable back to a primary standard. So let's get into workload and application checklist. Um, eventually we're gonna show you a, a checklist here. Um, so if you have the ability to take a screen grab, it's probably a good idea, but that'll happen in a few, a few more slides. Um, the checklist we'll get to, but I wanted to just quickly review with everybody what is a process loop or when we talk about a loop, what it is that we're actually talking about, and then where these points of measurement and simulation or sourcing may happen. So very quickly, this is just a water tank example. Now we have what's known as a process fluid. You should see my cursor moving here. There's a process fluid, and in here there'll be a temperature sensing element. Uh, that temperature sensing element uh, will provide a continuous measurement. It's in contact with the fluid and it provides a signal back to a temperature transmitter. That temperature transmitter is connected to an indicator or controller that's going to give us maybe a local indication or do some um, calculations in here and control something like a process valve. The process valve um, is presently open in this application. It's allowing gas to flow into the burner, which is allowing us to heat up, and it's reading, say, 97.4 degrees Celsius. Um, if we have a target temperature of, say, 100 degrees Celsius for this water in here, uh, what will happen is as the temperature increases, it'll show on the indicator until it reaches 100. And when it reaches 100 degrees Celsius, there'll be a change in the signal going to the control valve. It'll turn it off and therefore our burner will no longer operate and it'll allow us to get to that temperature and shut things off. That's very simply using temperature transmitter to basically control a single on off valve and control a switch. That's what we're talking about when it comes to what a process um, uh, valve may be. Sorry, I just had some pop ups on my window uh, screens here. Um, just a quick clarification you can still hear me, right, Chris? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you, because I had a, some pop-ups saying you wanted some hardware and I wasn't prepared to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's get back to the process loop. Um, so we've gone through this process loop. We, we have identification here for what the transmitter is sending. This, this sensor and element is a part of what we're going to actually calibrate. Uh, we may get into the point where here on the transmitter, we may want to calibrate this part of the loop and maybe even the output from the controller back. So I mentioned earlier, get ready for a screen grab. Um, I'm not gonna read every single one of these points to you, but when we go and make a list of the type of equipment that we have to calibrate, we'll be able to coordinate uh, what type of um, uh, equipment we need or calibration gear we need to be able to satisfy our needs in the field or not needs on a bench. 
Um, you may ask yourself, like, what are the temperatures you need to calibrate? Do I have any high temperatures or very cold temperatures? Uh, you're going to want to know what your process loop accuracy tolerances are so that you're going to be able to maintain four to ten times more accuracy in the test equipment they're using to do the calibrations or verifications. Um, do we have any critical accuracies that we need special attention? What I mean by that is we may have a whole bunch of process equipment that's just doing its job and we're happy with two or three degree accuracy on the loop, but you may have something that's a tenth of a degree accuracy and you need something more specific to do that job. So as you go through this list, you'll see them, they, they have a general tendency to direct you as to what types of equipment you may need. So getting back to your workload, temperature is everywhere. It's actually the second most uh, measured value in the world. The first is time and the second is temperature. Um, so what I want to do moving past this is, first of all, get an understanding of how big your workload can be. That's one of the first steps to do. And then understand your financial resources and some specific technical knowledge to get you what you need to do to get the results that you need. So um, what we should also understand, and I didn't mention it in the workload list, but we should understand the difference between contact and non-contact temperature sensing and uh, review the differences between electrical and mechanical temperature sensing applications. I mentioned that four to one UUT, UUT stands for unit under test. So we want to be four times more accurate than the unit that we're testing. Okay, that's kind of an industry standard for the minimum accuracy. Okay, let's talk quickly about the different types of devices that you will go and need to calibrate. So um, we have contact and non-contact type of me methods for making temperature measurements. Um, in the contact world, there is some pretty basic or standard types of contact measurement tools. So the mechanical ones, which provide like a visual output, they may have liquid and glass thermometers. Um, you may have biometal uh, temperature gauges, expanding temperature liquid filled bulbs. Um, there may be even gas actuated temperature, which are gas filled, but all of these will change the, something physical about them that will give you an indication for the actual temperature. Um, the probes type, probe, uh, temperature probes, I should say, there's a couple of different key types. Uh, we see thermocouples, which are two dissimilar metals that are bonded together at the end, creating a, a contact measurement point. Um, there's an RTD, which is a resistant uh, temperature device. Uh, it changes with resistance to temperature. Um, and then there's one that's maybe used a little less industrially and maybe more in pharmaceuticals or what the case may be, um, or even your uh, temperature controller for your furnace at your house will use a fairly inexpensive product called a thermistor. Um, they don't get used in industry because they have very narrow temperature bands um, and they're a different type of material. They're semiconductor material. Um, but those are the three types of probes that you'll find um, typically used uh, in industry or, or you'll come across from a probe style. Uh, contact temperature, actually there's some advantages to using a contact type probe. First of all, the probe is in contact with the material you're measuring. There's no um, guessing, I guess is a good way to word that. Um, they provide such a wide range of applications. Um, thermocouples, then, as, as an example, can get you into the thousands of degrees, uh, depending on which thermocouple type you, you select. Um, a lot of times you can get local indication without power. So um, even though uh, maybe not from the probe style, but definitely from the uh, mechanical styles, you don't have to have power at the application. So you don't have to bring a set of wires out to turn on a transmitter. You just have um, a temperature gauge that gives you a local indication. You just walk up and, and take a look at it. That can be super convenient. Um, sometimes uh, you may have some distances to send the signal back. So this is the transmitter part of the loop. Um, if you have a long distance to send the signal back, a four to 20 uh, loop uh, is very, very popular. Um, if you have um, other industrial systems, you may have uh, those signals going back on a bus network, uh, depending on how your control system is set up, but uh, they're really intended to send uh, the signals long distances. Um, again, controllers can change the process operation. So these are all parts of the loop that we need to make sure that we kind of isolate and calibrate um, either independently or maybe even as a complete system. Um, just a quick comment here between RTDs and thermocouples. Uh, this is just an education if you're not familiar with these two types of temperature uh, measurement probes. Um, but the main difference uh, is them, between them is that thermocouples are typically less expensive, about a third of the price of an RTD. 
Um, there's a narrower temperature range on RTDs, um, primarily because the material that gets used can't handle the higher temperatures. But because there's a narrow range, their scale outputs um, drastically during the shift. Uh, it actually provides a better signal that we can measure, so it become inherently more accurate. Okay. Um, we can have very quick temperature response times with thermocouples. They're much faster than RTDs. So if you have something where the temperature changes quickly, uh, that's good to use um, rather than using an RTD. Uh, on the accuracy side, RTDs are roughly 10 times more accurate than a thermocouple. Um, linearity is a discussion that we can bring up now. Linearity is how well the actual device Uh, Ken, I'm just going to stop you there. Um, I'm going to verify. It looks our connect, uh, looks uh, like our connection is freezing a little bit, and I think we lost your microphone. Yeah, unfortunately, I cannot hear you at all. Uh, let me verify. Sorry, folks, just bear with us a couple seconds here. We'll get this uh, taken care of and we'll go back to the presentation. Ken, can you uh, test your mic? No, unfortunately, it appears we've lost your mic completely. Not yet, no. You hear me now? There we are. I don't know. Uh, nothing really changed on my end. I just disconnected and reconnected. So we'll continue from there. I'm not sure what part to get, but I will try to jump back in the presentation. Much I'm better. The, uh, I'm going to leave the sound check here. And uh, that's a small pop on my end. So hopefully it'll be for us. Sounds good. If, if you lose me at any point in time, then. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, uh, okay, perfect. So uh, back here, I don't know where we lost me, but uh, this screen that's been up now for a little bit of time, it's just showing the difference between RTDs and thermocouples. Um, I guess the way from where to explain it is thermocouples have a wider temperature range, less accurate, or rough at the end of the day, than an RTD, which is moderate, has a wider temperature range, and considering very standard too. Version. So, a temp and thermal major incredibly pot. And I hate to do this to you, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, for the past 15, 20 seconds, we're getting ins and outs. Uh, again, sorry, everyone. Uh, we will try and get this uh, handled as quickly as possible. Is my. Um, yeah. Here. I'm gonna shut. I'm gonna shut my uh, monitor, my screen off my camera. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, no problem. If it's a bandwidth issue, we do running because I'm not doing anything there. That definitely possibility. So uh, we'll we'll yeah. try it this way. And, and we'll, uh, uh, I'm actually hard connected, you know, a, a cable into my internet. So um, I'm not trying to use Wi-Fi. So I don't think that's the problem. I just don't have any indication when it goes away. So. So far, so it, just shutting off the, the cam so far right now has improved it immensely. So let's go with that way. Let, let's, let's hope that does it. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. So as long as you can still see my screen, um, again, I was just... talking about non-contact methods and, and thermal imagers and temperature guns have become very popular. Uh, what's happening is a lot of people are using temperature guns um, for spot checks, which is fine, um, but they may not completely understand that there are some inherent inaccuracies that are either driven by the temperature guns themselves or by the users. 
Um, they're great for comparison, but they're not necessarily great for making an accurate temperature measurement. Uh, we could have a completely separate one hour discussion about these, and I don't want to bog down this part of the presentation because there's some pretty important things that we want to cover today to give you some knowledge and and making improvements in your temperature calibrations. Uh, so I'm not going to bog down too much. Just know that they're out there and that they are actually um, handy and they work really great for applications that are uh, would require um, maybe something that's electrically live where you're not going to put a probe onto it um, or something that's very far away and you want to still be able to make a rough indication of what the temperature is or something you're not going to continuously monitor the temperature, you just want to make a spot check. Okay. Um, so there's some picture examples of what we're talking about. But again, I'm not going to slow down the presentation too, too much on these non-contact thermal imagers and, and spot temperature guns. What I would like to do is focus on how we can make improvements to our actual process um, calibrations today. So one of the considerations you need to understand or, or would help to understand is the difference between sourcing and simulating temperature. So when we uh, simulate an actual temperature, we're actually replacing the temperature sensor in the, in the system and sending the exact signal that should be coming from that sensor into a transmitter from a calibrated device. So in this particular example, we have a Fluke 724 and it's sending uh, using this connection point here for thermocouple and sending that thermocouple signal into the inputs of the transmitter. And what's being measured on the output is the 4 to 20 milliamps. Now, this device is powering the transmitter. It's not powered externally. And in this case, it's putting out the table value from that thermocouple type K for what would be 50 degrees Celsius and, the, and simultaneously measuring a response. Um, this, is, this is typical of a, what a process calibrator would do. Uh, this one is portable process calibrator. Uh, they're typically small, easy to operate, battery powered. They can power the loop. Um, but what it ultimately does is it gives us the ability to simulate not just this one type, but many different types of thermocouples into these different transmitters that we have in the field. Okay. The other way I mentioned earlier was sourcing a temperature. So when you source a temperature, you actually need a temperature source. Um, some people might consider, you know, an ice water slurry a temperature source, or you could have boiling water as a temperature source. Um, those are two points of measurement, uh, and they would only be as accurate as you know the, the quality of the materials and the measurement that you would have. What these devices are, um, there's dry wells and you know um, wet baths, but what they do is they actually source the temperature. They have controllers on them, and they source the temperature into uh, this particular well. This is an example of what's inside. It's like we had a cutaway. Um, so there's a well. You put your sensor into the well. And now you're calibrating from the sensor into the controller. Okay, you are you're including the temperature probe that you want to measure as a part of your calibration. So this eliminates the errors um, from the sensor. So if you have a sensor that's going out or not not operating properly, um, using the previous slide, you would have to you know measure the sensor and then simulate the sensor. In this particular case, you're only sourcing it once and sending that signal into a transmitter. Um, you can remove, if it works really well if you can remove your FOBR sensor from the process, um, but if you can't remove it, then it becomes more difficult. You would not do it this way. You maybe do it on the bench and do a swap or something. Um, again, anytime you need to calibrate the part or the probe as a part of the process, uh, it's the sourcing part is critical. So when you come to pick a, a probe, in other words, what is the pro calibration requirement? You need to have a pretty good understanding going back to that work list that I had put on the screen um, as to the shape, the size, the dimension of the probe. Uh, if you're using a temperature source like a dry block, um, you're going to want to make sure that the probe matches the well of the dry block. In other words, the hole in the dry block is the right size, not only dimension, but depth. And uh, we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. But the shape of the probe in terms of the diameter and the length is critical. Um, understanding where the sensor element is in that probe, a lot of times, I would say 90% of the time, it's right down near the tip of the probe, but sometimes there may be even secondary or another uh, sensor measurement somewhere in the middle of the probe, and knowing where that is, it's important to making proper calibration as well. Um, and if you have many that you want to calibrate at one time, say, for instance, you're working at a production facility and you want to calibrate, you know, 100 probes at once, 
um, having them done individually in a dry well may not be as advantageous as putting them all into a wet bath at the same time. So understanding these different um, configurations will help you direct what type of equipment you need. There's a comment here about a micro bath or dry well. Primarily things that are irregular shapes um, or have very demanding temperature stabilities. Um, a, a wet bath uh, has a very nice, long, consistent temperature. Uh, it doesn't vary across the temperature system itself. Um, you know, within all the liquid, it's pretty much the same temperature. Um, that's what we call stability. Uh, if you, again, have high volumes or even tighter accuracies, then um, using a, a, a bath would be a better choice than using a dry well. Um, I mentioned inserts or wells. Uh, on the side here is a picture of some inserts or wells that are used with dry blocks. Um, dry blocks are typically lighter uh, because you're not trying to change the temperature of this big liquid mass. Um, you have much faster capabilities to make a temperature change, which in turn results in quicker calibrations. Um, they're typically portable in the sense that you can pick them up and still carry them. They're not going to be, you know, splashing liquids around. Uh, they're not, um, they're not uh, battery powered by any stretch because there's heaters and whatnot in them. But they're portable in the sense that there's handles built onto them. They typically weigh less than 20 pounds, and as long as you have 120 volts available to plug in, uh, these devices will work perfectly fine for you. Um, if you happen to own some good process calibration equipment like the 754 or 744, which was its predecessor, we have some unique capabilities in those products to communicate with the Fluke dry wells and automate calibrations. Um, I have a complete section on that capability later down in the presentation. Um, if you have the, this one in the middle here, uh, this particular model has two fixed, fixed sizes of wells. Um, but if you get a, a higher end model that has interchangeable wells, you can pick and choose two or three different wells to find exactly the right size for your application. Um, so the inserts are less money than buying a block that's fixed with a certain size hole in it. And you can mix and match the inserts as needed to match your, your uh, calibration requirements. This particular device over here is actually very interesting. This is a super high temperature, um, what we call a furnace. Uh, we use it for calibrating uh, thermocouples, the actual thermocouple probes themselves. And uh, it can get to thousands of degrees in a self-contained box. I wouldn't consider this portable by any stretch, but if you needed to, it would still run on 120. There is another way of doing calibrations. Uh, it's very popular. Uh, we call them comparison calibrations. It's where you leave your probe in the process. And what it allows you to do is take the signal off of your probe and compare it to a more accurate handheld device. Um, so this example is a 1524 reference tool. Uh, it plugs in, it's usually a port connected somewhere nearby that's closed off 90% of the time. And then when you come by, you can make a temperature reference and comparisons between what the process is telling you and what this device is. It's not automated in any sense. Um, you would be measuring four to 20 with another tool and converting that or making a temperature measurement off the probe here and making a, an adjustment to the transmitter. But this would give you an ability to actually make a very accurate comparison. So you're not actually changing the temperature source, you're letting your process fluid be that temperature source and doing a comparison calibration. Again, um, not to spend a lot of time on the non-contact, but there is ways to calibrate non-contact temperature devices. Um, it's what we, with what we call a um, black body source. Uh, so these actually heat up, and this surface here is considered a black body or 100% emissive, and you would use a temperature gun or a thermal imager to make a measurement spot on there. Uh, the controller would tell you what temperature it is, and then you compare that to what's on your temperature gun. Um, when you do run with a temperature gun, uh, you notice there's different sizes. This is a nice little handheld portable one. I would say that spot is about two and a half, three inches, where this one is closer to eight or nine inches in diameter. Um, but knowing what we call distance to spot ratio of your temperature guns or thermal imagers is important because you gotta be able to get your temperature spot within there and the distance that's being measured from. Okay, um, let's go through here really quickly. Are you still able to hear me, Chris? Yes, I am. Okay, because this window popped up again. Um, 
what I'm going to do is run through, uh, we have an application note and I believe uh, ITM is making it available um, to you through, I believe the chat window or something like that. Uh, Chris, I don't know how you can confirm where they can get that or are we going to send it to them afterwards if they want it? We have handouts uh, available right now within the, um, I guess, taskbar toolbar that all participants have access to that you can click on them and you can download download them directly to your uh, to your PC. We'll also be following up with an email with all those handouts included if you don't get a chance to throughout the presentation. Okay, perfect. So this particular link um, and the one you find in the chat uh, there is, this is a 26 page application note that covers all of these different types of calibrations. Um, I highly recommend you grab it, especially if any of these specifically touch into what it is that you do on a regular basis. Um, using that in mind, I'm going to con concentrate on just three of them, um, maybe potentially the most popular. I'm sorry if I'm not covering the one that you wanted, but we'll go through three of these today and talk about some of the improvements and technical tips that we can provide for each one. So the first one is calibrating and testing RTD sensors. So RTD sensors, um, again, more accurate. Um, they may send signals back to a panel meter or a temperature transmitter. However, if there's a problem suspected with the temperature sensor, um, you need to be able to perform it using a dry well or a micro bath. So you need to actually simulate the temperature to the device. So um, this is a comparison type calibration. Um, and the tech tips that we're gonna give you on this include um, making sure that um, your conditions that you're outside, you know, they're, they're not typically the greatest conditions. Um, so if you may have wide temperature variations. Um, so if that's the case, like if I grabbed this dry well and took it outside, there are operating specifications on our data sheet. As long as you're operating within those specifications, all the other standards and accuracies that we have will be maintained. Um, but you want to make sure that you don't go too far outside them because you'll have temperature gradients. And what we mean by temperature gradients is that the sensor may be saying that it's a certain temperature, but you have temperature gradients to where it's colder. The heat wants to go from hot to cold, and that may be the case, or you're in a hotter environment and uh, you may be disrupting the ability of the, of the block to stabilize. So from a tech tip, keep that in mind. Um, when you're actually sourcing the temperatures, um, the critical measurement points are confirmed. What we mean by that is we have the ability to control the actual temperature of this device and provide a sourced value that matches exactly what your process is looking for. So if you have a, say for instance, you have a temperature at, I don't know, it's under pressure, say 200 degrees Celsius is when the actual system does a reaction you can actually calibrate right at 200 degrees Celsius, okay? You just type in the exact value and we'll take you right to there. You're not trying to say, well, if I'm at zero and 100, because I'm using some other type of temperature source that I have to extrapolate into where that might be to see if it's if it's um, accurate or not. This gives you the ability to go right to that point, okay? Um, dry wells, again, we already talked earlier about them. They have uh, different types of dry wells, and that provides you the flexibility to deal with all the different probes that you have in your systems. Um, this may be obvious, um, but if it's not obvious, do not put fluid in your dry well. Um, some people will put thermal conductive paste on an insert and try to insert it. That's, that's going to actually break down um, between the two and um, maybe even potentially stick the insert in your dry well permanently, which would be a very expensive mistake. So um, we've seen some pretty crazy things. We've seen people take their inserts out and insert fluid in there because they have some strange irregular shape. Um, and then the fluid may leave some residue. And then the next time they put an insert in, it gets stuck. Um, the, the air gap clearances are all machined within, you know, for the most part, thousands of inches. Um, the factory takes in serious consideration between what happens with thermal expansion and they make sure that if you use any of our any of our inserts get used in there they're not going to get locked in the dry block and they're also going to not lock onto your probe so all of that has been taken into consideration when you when you do it so just I, to say avoid using anything that you put inside the dry well that's not supposed to be there um as a technical tip, when you go to do a temperature calibration, um, if you're doing another process calibration, say pressure as an example, um, it's pretty pretty easy to do 
uh, temperature calibration at 0% of the span, 50% of the span, 100% of the span, and then go back down to 50 and then down to 100. In fact, you may have different temperature or different pressure steps in there. You might do a five up and five down calibration. Um, I just explained the three up, three down. Um, when it comes to temperature calibrations, because the standard itself takes such a long time to change temperature and become stabilized, when I say long time, I'm talking, you know, depending on the size of the dry well, it could be nine minutes to 15 minutes to get to one temperature point. Because it takes a long time to do that, we don't recommend that you go up and back down on your typical calibration. We suggest you start at the colder temperature, um, get it into the range that you're comfortable with, stabilize, move to the next point, and then maybe potentially move to the third point for your calibration point, and then effectively your calibration is done at that point in time. When you are dealing with RTDs, you may have the opportunity to do um, linearization. I mentioned it earlier where we linearize a probe. Um, if you haven't heard of this term, calendar van Dusen equations, um, basically what it is, it's a multi-term polynomial that will linearize the actual curve of your probe to the ideal. So in this example down here in the lower left-hand corner, uh, we have um, a graph or a, a, a graph or representation. It's just a rough representation of the different tolerances. So if you buy an RTD with a class B tolerance, you're allowed to operate in this range. Class A tolerance would be a tighter range. There is the ideal that an RTD would be manufactured to, but because they're physical devices, they all have their own personality, their own characteristics. So when we can calibrate them and come up with the actual resistance values, we can come up and enter them into this software that we sell called Tableware. We enter in the reference temperature and then what the actual resistance was, and then we calculate these values here. I'm sorry if it's small on your screen. I couldn't get it much larger on my screen, to be honest with you. Um, but there are some variables that we come up with. You can put these back into a transmitter if the transmitter has the ability to put these calendar van Dusen offsets into the transmitter. And what it does is it linearizes the probe from the actual, which is the black line, to the ideal, which is the, the yellow line, and it effectively increases your accuracy, um, sometimes even tenfold, um, as it's shown in this particular uh, screen on the bottom here. So this is an example where it's four times better, the system accuracy. But if you take a look, almost all of that accuracy comes from the RTD probe itself when it gets linearized. It goes from one degree Celsius to 0.18 degrees, as an example. So if you if you need more accuracy, there's there's typically a way we can get you there. Uh, the next one I want to show you and talk about is simulating. So we just talked about sourcing RTD values. Um, let's talk about simulating uh, thermocouples and RTDs. Uh, we have devices that have both RTD and thermocouple simulation together in one uh, one particular handheld device. So it doesn't matter what type of probe you're dealing with in industry, we have the capability of doing it with just one tool. Again, this is the application where you may measure the probe's RTD or, temp or thermocouple value and document it from its own process value. Um, but typically what you're doing is you're taking that probe out of service and you're replacing our calibrator with that probe and sending the signal to a transmitter. So just as shown in these two examples, uh, we are simulating this value into the transmitter and making a measurement back out. Um, conversely, this is an RTD connection, a four-wire RTD connection, where we're simulating the resistance to this transmitter for what a known temperature is, and then measuring the response back off, and that's how we do a calibration. Um, so there's some technical tips or things that you should really consider. Uh, when you're simulating a thermocouple, make sure you always use the same thermocouple wire and the same thermocouple connections. What happens with thermocouples is they're actually two dissimilar metals that will create a millivolt when they are bonded together. And that millivolt uh, references or makes um, sends a signal um, based on the temperature uh, that that, sent, that junction is. If you start mixing metals, you start messing up the ability of the uh, thermocouple to actually make the correct measurement for temperature. And effectively, you're making more junctions along the way. So it's, it's highly recommended um, practice to stay away from that. If you have a long distance to go, like you notice in this particular case, we've tied the thermocouple wire directly into the transmitter. If you have a long distance to go, some people will 
you know, maybe use a set of regular test leads to get the wire signal back, that millivolt signal back, and that actually creates another junction. So it's not recommended. If you do have long distances to go, we recommend you use um, thermocouple extension wire, which is something that you can buy from ITM, okay? Uh, when testing three-wire RTE uh, circuits, uh, make sure you connect all three wires from the sourcing into the device being tested. Um, if you if you happen to, you know, just like you notice all four wires come back here, they don't, you know, short out and take two two wires back. We want all four wires to come back because part of the measurement is the actual resistance of the test leads itself. So when we know the resistance of the test leads, we can mathematically remove it from the calculated value. And it's effectively as if we connected the, the sourcing device directly to these connections. Um, that's why we use three wire and four wire RTDs so we can get an idea of the resistance of the test lead. Let's talk about automating calibrations. I mentioned earlier that temperature calibrations, you know, you may take anywhere between nine to 20 minutes to stabilize a dry block. And then you'll have to go and take a measurement and then you adjust the temperature, go brew a cup of coffee, come back, drink half of your coffee, wait for the temperature to stabilize and take another measurement. There's really, today, there's really no way around those physical temperature source changes um, in terms of time, because you need things to come up, be stabilized, everything has to be stable, and then you make a measurement. But if there was a way that we could automate the process all of that time waiting for adjustments and gathering data can be done spent doing something else. So in this particular case, we have a Fluke 754 and a dry block calibrator. We've connected a transmitter directly in where we are sourcing the temperature to the transmitter and measuring the corresponding four to 20 back into the device. But you notice there's an extra cable here. This extra cable allows us to do a communication from the 754 into the dry block. And by closing the loop of this calibration um, in between the two calibration devices, you can have the 754 automatically change the set points on this dry block. Once the set point is reached and stable, the 754, there will be a signal coming back from the dry block into the 754 saying, I've reached it, I'm stable, capture this value up here off of the transmitter. Once that value is captured and retained in its memory, we have the ability to change the set point again automatically. So we can go through multiple temperature set points. You're not limited to just 0, 50, 100%. You could go 0, 10, 30, 40, all the way up. You could do 10 point calibrations if you wanted to. Um, we can actually come back down again if you're concerned about um, what they call hysteresis on the temperature sensors themselves or the overall measurement circuitry here. So we have that ability to automate this. Uh, if, say for instance, it takes 15 minutes between temperature points to stabilize and you want to do a 10 point cal that's uh, at least 150 minutes of calibration um, all of that time that you would normally be sitting there babysitting waiting for the next value to go you can go do something else um, this is this cable if you own either of these two devices and you want to get them connected together i believe the cable is less than 300 dollars um, it's it's pretty amazing in terms of the ultimate um, takeaway. So this is the key piece to get these two connected together. We're going to run through a real quick example here, um, but the steps are highlighted here. I'll just make it quick. If you're on a 754, uh, which is a documenting process calibrator from Fluke, and you source temperature, so we're in here and we're sourcing temperature, one of the options will be dry well. When you connect the dry well, it will try to make a connection once it makes a connection, it'll tell you that it's connected to the device. You can source the actual thermocouple value into it. You can set up the, um, sorry, the source the actual temperature value into the dry block. Now you can set up an automated calibration for what you're planning to measure, what you're planning to source, how many points of calibration you want. And then the next step is to um, get us on a split screen and do an automated calibration and find the results. Again, this results page is stored in memory. So you have the ability to recall it later, or if you're super fancy, you can use a piece of software to pull this data out and generate a, um, a calibration report. That requires um, our Fluke DPC Track 2 software, which we can also talk to you about. So this inexpensive serial cable that's available from us will connect Fluke or Heart dry blocks if you have the older branding from us 
with uh, Fluke 754 or 744 documenting calibrators. And again, the main application advantage is just the ability to do all of this automated and speed yourself up. Okay, um, because of our technical issues, we're running into some time here, so I'll try to get through some of this. Um, I want to bring to your attention a few major points of errors with regards to temperature calibrations. So one of them is getting temperature equilibrium and uniformity. So everything wants to, temperature wants to go from hot to cold and the rate at which it makes those changes is important. Um, every material is slightly different. When we're doing a calibration with the dry block, you can, this is the sensor that the controller on the dry block measures. So if you had one probe in here, that's what you'd be doing as the comparison. So any temperature difference across the gradient may be a source of error. If you want to eliminate this error, what you do is you put in a secondary probe that is more accurate than the unit under test, and then you kind of ignore what's on the display. So you set it to 100, but it's actually 100.568, and then you measure your actual unit under test and do your calibration based on those. So it's a quick calibration outside of the source value on the on the um, the actual uh, controller of the dry block. So that's one place that you can improve it. So you know, quickly going back to this presentation here, uh, you could have a secondary probe in here as well and eliminate this part. Um, that's something we can talk about as well. Um, another thing to pay attention to is something called stem conduction. So when we insert uh, a, a probe into a dry block, uh, it needs to meet a minimum depth. Okay, we suggest that um, one quarter of the overall probe length is exposed. That's one example, but another one is, I think it's your minimum assertion depth, depth is 20 times the diameter of your probe. So there's two different schools of thought internally on this, but the idea is that you want to get as much as the probe as you can into the drywall. Um, this is a different example I'll talk about, but the more you have sticking out, the more heat you have um, convecting and, and radiating potentially out of here, especially once you get to higher temperatures. So here's an example plot. I know there's a lot of curves going on here, but basically what we're showing you is, is the, the, um, the more insertion you have, in other words, the less that's sticking out, the more accurate you are to your standard. The more you have sticking out, the less uh, insertion you have, the more inaccurate it becomes. We have a whole document uh, application note about this if you want some information on that, but it's, it's pretty critical to keep in mind. Um, another thing about immersion depth is if you don't go fully immersed, this is the temperature gradient that you're dealing with, okay? Um, not only the fact that you're not getting full immersion, you're getting this distance between what the temperature thinks it is down here compared to what it is up here. And that's a, that air gap in itself creates errors. Um, again, I talked earlier about using thermocouples without the correct wire. If you happen to connect your thermocouple and use uh, incorrect wiring uh, or incorrect materials to extend the wire, uh, you'll actually create another junction. And that, that's a completely different source of error because that in itself becomes a, um, a counteracting force to the temperature being measured at the hot junction. Okay, um, we talked about uh, some of the um, technologies that are already available. So let's really quickly review a few things. Um, understand your temperature, guns, distance to spot ratio, and emissivity. Again, this would be a whole discussion separate from this presentation, but if you have these temp guns and you're relying on them for temperature, take a few moments to understand your distance to spot ratio. That's how big is the spot that I'm measuring at whatever distance. And emissivity is the rate at which the material gives off infrared energy. Just understand your material's emissivity and set the gun to match it. That's your best chance of getting a good measurement. Um, use a lot of this equipment today. You can take some lab accuracy that used to be kind of contained to the lab, you know, 15, even 10 years ago. Um, they're completely capable to go in the field today. This, this, the accuracy of this device um, would be considered lab grade accuracy. We actually call it a field metrology well. Um, do automation on your calibrations wherever possible. Um, that's probably your biggest way to save um, save some not only human error um, in terms of making measurements, but automating it and speeding it up. Um, time, I guess, is the word I was looking for. Um, batch test. So if you have more than one or two probes to do at once, uh, batch test them. 
either using multiple hole inserts. So you buy an insert that has all the same hole diameters and do five or six probes at once, uh, or you can put them into a fluid, a, a bath, a liquid bath, a micro bath, and measure them in that particular environment. Um, again, calibrate two temperatures with one device. We have this one device that gives us the ability to have like a hot side and a cold side, and you can just move the probe back and forth. They're independent of each other. So once they're up and they're stable, you can move the probe, let it stabilize, move it back here, let it stabilize, and it, it's quicker and faster. Um, the biggest trade-off with temperature calibration is speed versus accuracy. So just keeping that in mind that this is maybe not our most accurate solution, but if you're dealing with 1% process loops, this is a great product. And again, use software wherever possible. Um, software is becoming more and more popular when it comes to temperature calibrations and um, I just highly recommend investigating either your software options today for the existing equipment you have or take a look if you're buying new equipment what the software offering is today or where it may be moving in the future. Okay um, we are a couple minutes overdue uh, on this Q&A part of it but uh, just pulling it all together so temperature calibration is important to your operations. Um, the safety of your systems, the productivity of your plant or productivity or the quality of your product, it all depends on having proper calibrations uh, done for temperature. When you get into it, entire, your, understand your entire scope of work that needs to be done and get a handle on what equipment you have to be able to handle that. Look for gaps in your equipment capabilities, gaps in your knowledge and training within your staff itself. And uh, again, if you have the ability to use automation with some of your existing equipment, that may free up a bunch of time for you. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, this one hour presentation, as you can probably tell, is only scratching the surface of some of the knowledge that we have. Um, we'd be more than happy to help you with uh, understanding what temperature calibrations um, mean in terms of your specific application. Um, so feel free to reach out and uh, go find a way to get the knowledge and uh, use technical experts wherever possible. Um, again, seek training, further knowledge, and uh, drive your improvements with techniques, tips, tools, and consider again how software can be a big part of that uh, progression. So I want to thank you today. Um, I want to apologize uh, for all of the technical issues. Um, I think turning off the camera really saved some things, so that's a good learning to take away. Uh, in the meantime, what I do, I'll toss it back to Chris. Um, hopefully you have a few questions. Um, even one or two is fine and uh, toss it back to Chris and we'll try to wrap up here and get you on your way. And, and uh, if I don't get a chance at the end, I wanna thank you again today for your time and effort and listening. Very much appreciated, Ken. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, great presentation, a lot of information. Um, so now everyone, it's time to take advantage, as mentioned earlier, uh, to have Ken, an expert uh, like Ken, connected with us to shoot any and all questions that you possibly can have. Uh, please use the chat feature. We already did get a few questions uh, throughout the presentation. So we have about five or six minutes. Should be a decent amount of time to go over at least a few. Um, so please get them in the chat uh, ASAP. Um, just a quick mention, um, four questions. If you have any uh, product specific related questions, pricing, availability, rental options, uh, we encourage you to actually go directly to our website, itm.com. Uh, you'll find our entire list of uh, Fluke products with pricing, availability, all the technical data sheets, uh, as well as our contact information. If we don't get a chance to get to your questions uh, right now, you can always find a way to contact us through email, chat, or over the phone, and one of our technical represent, uh, rep representatives sorry, uh, will be able to answer your questions uh, without a doubt. So, uh, as mentioned, we did have a couple of questions that came in. Um, one, okay, um, so for a quick check, can I measure the temperature uh, of whatever they're looking at, I guess, they didn't go into specifics, with an infrared camera and compare it to, compare the readings from the infrared camera to a fixed thermometer? So, I would suggest that you're probably okay to do that. Um, we didn't touch on the whole concept of, you know, non-contact because there's a bunch of different uh, technical considerations. Um, I mentioned briefly emissivity. Uh, emissivity is the rate at which infrared energy comes off of a surface. 
and uh, thermal imager is actually not measuring temperature, it's measuring infrared energy and converting it into a temperature. Uh, that process of taking that infrared energy and converting it into a temperature is probably at best plus or minus two degrees Celsius. Um, there, you can get bigger errors based on emissivity, um, the state of the material, I mean, that is a solid or is a liquid, there's a bunch of different factors involved. Um, there is actually a bit of a distance component if you're in a humid environment, so we can get super technical in terms of it. Um, I'll say this, thermal imagers are excellent at making temperature comparisons. So if I wanted to know what was hot compared to what was cold, it does a great job. If I'm actually trying to quantify using a thermal imager, it can be a little bit difficult, and I recommend you learn as much as you can about all the technical differences on your imager. With that said, comparing it to a locally, like an analog uh, temperature gauge that's screwed in somewhere, um, that temperature gauge is giving you the temperature of the sensing element inside of the process. So it's more closely in contact. Um, the thermal imager is going to give you the temperature of the surface of the material that may be in contact with that process. So even there, there may be some temperature gradients as well. So it'd be difficult without knowing exact specifications, but if you're talking a quick check, um, if you had an idea of the ambient environment and how that changed or whatever, you could start to take some of those considerations into effect and then come up with your own idea, is it good or not? I don't know if I've answered the question, but there's a lot of variables and I would not be able to say, yes, you can do it. I think that was a great job of uh, doing so. Uh, we had a question come in <clears throat> based on uh, just the, the presentation uh, in a whole, so Daria, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, yes, a recorded version of the webinar uh, will be available. Uh, it will be sent out uh, once available, probably over the next uh, few days or so. Um, uh, let's see. So this is a bit of a general question, but um, just, a, I guess, a general sense of uh, using the any type of calibration. Can it be said that uh, it can it, they can calibrate uh, the instruments that don't necessarily require a certified uh, certificate of calibration. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, there's different terms that we use. Uh, there's calibration, there's certified or traceable calibrations. Um, then the other term that maybe more appropriately matches what you're talking about is something called a verification. So a verification may be when you just go up to it, make a measurement and say, yes, it's still accurate enough for what I'm doing, but don't make any actual adjustments. Um, in fact, there's some conversation and communication internally, like is a calibration, does does that indicate on itself that we're actually making an adjustment or not? And I, and I would argue that that's not the case. In that particular case, if I had traceable pieces of like process equi test equipment and I wanted to you know, confirm the accuracy of my process, if I'm just doing a comparison check and using a traceable piece of equipment um, and I'm within the accuracy specification that I've actually you know verified and calibrated that that device is as found was accurate enough for my process I don't know if that answered the question do you think it did Chris I just want to make sure I think I covered it oh I think you covered that basis completely that I think that's perfect mm -hmm. and, and just having the 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 difference between each um certification calibration and verification i think that's perfect and that's exactly what they were looking for at least from my perspective okay um so uh to respect everyone's time we are getting to the top of the, the bottom of the hour um so i will uh call uh, the q a portion end uh, there uh we do have a few questions that are left over in the queue i assure you that um either myself or our team of technical specialists will get back to you um, to answer your questions. If you have any that come up uh, that, you know, in a half hour from now, oh, I should have asked that question, please go to our website, itm.com, uh, the contact us page. You can find our contact information there. Uh, you can send us an email, join a chat uh, with one of our technical represent representatives, or uh, you can also give us a call as well. Um, so I'm going to thank Ken once again for a fantastic presentation, lots of information for all of us to take home to and think about. Um, and I will ask, I will thank all of you uh, for t attending our webinar today. Uh, so on behalf of uh, ITM University, thank you once again. 
Um, as mentioned throughout a few times throughout the presentation, ITM Instruments, uh, we are here to help you in any way possible. Visit our website, itm.com, for anything that you need. You'll be able to uh, have access to our entire list of Fluke products with descriptions, specifications, data sheets, pricing, availability, our rental section as well. Um, as well, once again, our contact information can be found uh, and we have plenty of different ways to connect with one of our technical uh, experts as well. Uh, at the end of this webinar, in just a few short minutes, there will be a, a short survey that will ask you to complete. Your feedback will assist us in improving and allowing us to bring you more topics that are of interest to you. Uh, another reminder, we also have upcoming webinars over the next uh, few weeks and months. So uh, on our website, itm.com, there's a training section up there in the top header. You can go there and you get a full list of our schedule uh, with dates and topics as well. And don't forget, uh, as a thank you for attending today, your name will be entered into a draw to win $100 for your next online order. Uh, the winner will be announced on our social media channel, so please be sure to check us out there. Once again, Ken, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. We wish you a great rest of the day. Thanks, Ken. Bye.